Good evening. Welcome to EdChat Interactive. My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm uh, hosting you or administrating EdChat Interactive tonight. And our stars are going to be uh, Becky Staubach and uh, Jane Tassel from Western Kentucky University. Uh, they wrote a book called, called The Real World Learning Framework, and we're going to be learning how to apply real world examples uh, to uh, classes <coughs> both in elementary school and secondary school. I want to talk a little bit before we get started on uh, EdChat Interact. Our goal is to provide a more interactive learning experience than a typical webinar. Uh, is you know if you're used to webinars in the past in talking heads and and slides, what we're trying to do is trying to get you to participate because we all understand that people learn better when they're in so we're going to be asking you to interact, reflect, participate, and let me explain how that's going to work. First of all, there's two buttons underneath your avatar. There's a raise hand button and an ask button. There's going to be times where we're going to be asking somebody as a volunteer to come up and talk on stage with, with our authors tonight. And so we'll ask you, if you want to come up, raise your hand. I will say that's a great opportunity to learn because they'll be talking to you about what goes on in your school and your classroom and you can apply it directly. So I'd like to encourage you when you're asked uh, to, if, if you're interested in coming up, click on the raise hand button and we'll bring you up on stage. Uh, the second button underneath is ask. If you have a question, uh, you click on the ask button and a uh, pop-up will come up, uh, type in your question, that then comes to me and I'll I'll pass it to them so that they can answer it. So those are the first two ways of interacting, raising hand and asking. Uh, the second way, uh, or the third way of interacting is through a back channel. Now, some of you may already have this up, but if you don't, move your cursor over your avatar and you'll see that there's a five icon menu, uh, one of which is settings that allows you to adjust your video or your audio. But the most important one is the IM setting. And if you click on that, you'll get a text box that appears. And that's a great uh, back channel that you can talk to your other participants with. Um, what uh, There'll be times during, during the session where we'll be asking for, how would you apply this in your classroom? And we'll be asking you to type in the IM window to, sh to share with your participants um, and, to dis you know, and, and for you to comment on some of the items that, that they put up as well. So you have the back channel or the IM chat window open. Uh, I happen to be the only person here tonight who can't see it. Uh, and uh, what I'd like you to do is maybe introduce yourself. And um, if you're, why don't you say what grade you teach or what your role is in education? Are you an administrator? Are you a second grade teacher? And just introduce yourself so that uh, we can get a, a better understanding of who's here tonight. So I'll give you a chance to do that. And then the final way of interacting, and I'm, I don't think we're going to do this tonight because we're going to be asking a number of you to come up on stage. The final way of interacting is that if you wanted to discuss something with another person in the audience, you can click on that person's avatar and you can have a private video chat with that person. So that's really the final way of interacting. Uh, let me just go over them again very quickly. There's raise hand, which we're going to ask you to come up on stage and talk about your situation. There's <coughs> ask, which allows you to ask a question. There's IM, which is a back channel, uh, which allows everybody to join in a conversation. And there's clicking on another person's avatar, which allows you to have a private conversation with that person. Uh, I also want to say, you know, we have a few more EdChat Interactives coming up. The next two are both... Um, in conjunction with this serious play conference, uh, Tammy Schrader from uh, Oregon is going to be talking about uh, the steps that, that she created in order to run a regional game jam for all of Eastern Oregon. And on May 3rd, we're talking to Patrick Soria, who's going to be talking about how uh, getting students involved with music uh, can help really lock in different different subjects. Uh, he's worked with gifted, he's worked with special ed students, he's worked with um, autistic students, and he's found that this is a great way to create an inclusive classroom 
where everybody learns. So those those are two interesting sessions. Um, just go to edchatinteractive.org and you can register. And then uh, let me just inter you know, introduce our our two speakers tonight. Uh, Becky and Janet are both uh, associate professors at Western Kentucky University. Uh, they both have taught, they both administrated, um, and uh, Becky was AST, the ASCD uh, Social Studies Teacher of the Year in 2004. Uh, they've uh, joined together uh, with, um, I guess, obviously one other person, uh, to write uh, two books about the real world learning framework one for elementary schools and one for high schools. Um, and I've read excerpts of those books, and I'll tell you, they're, they're packed with examples that you can apply directly to your classes. Tonight, they're going to be talk, giving an overview and giving you different examples that you can, that you can use in your, in your classes. And what I'm going to do is stop this presentation and bring them up. Well. Uh, and I don't even know what time. Are you on Eastern time or are you on Central time? We're on Central, Central. time. It's 6 o'clock okay. here. Okay, because I see how light it is in, in back you. Here it's, uh, it's, I'm on the East Coast, so it's getting a little clear. So just just a quick, maybe it isn't so quick, but what what prompted you to write a book? How did you get involved with, with authoring? We're actually going to talk all about that. So if you could oh, go ahead and okay. get us started on our on our slides, we have that built right into our presentation. Okay, it was, a, it was a good segue. Okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah that's a great segue. Good job. <laughs> so we'd like to say good evening. We're really excited to be with you here this evening. And thank you for giving up your time to share and learn with us this evening. Um, we are excited to share our work with you regarding the real world framework along with digital tools and practical strategies for successful implementation. And go ahead with the next slide. As you can see, I'm here with my colleague, Becky Stobaugh, and I am Janet Tassel. And we are excited to share our real world learning journey with you as well. In this slide, you can put a picture to our faces, but hopefully you can also see us as we're talking with you. Um, to give a little background, about eight years ago, the two of us were working with elementary science and math pre-service teachers in lesson planning and also with current practicing in-service teachers. We were finding that they were not able to understand how to reach higher levels of thinking in their planning while also making real-world connections, um, plan meaningful interactions, among the students in their classes, and there was also an absence of technology integration that was meaningful. Next slide. So we began talking about the kind of problems that we were having and how to fix them. What questions we had, how, how might we help others, and maybe you found or you find yourself asking some of the same questions. Are these challenges for you as well? So things like integrating student interests, connecting to the real world, posing provocative questions, designing instruction around collaborative tasks, and the last one, integrating technology to support student learning. These were all things that we were struggling with and saw um, an issue of how to help our teachers learn how to do this as well. So what happened? Next slide. we found a need for a new framework and began working with our technology education colleague, Marge Maxwell. We designed an instructional framework and the CREATE framework was born. Next, please. So let's talk a bit, bit about the um, components. Our framework centers on the real world learning. We have found when teachers it design instruction around authentic context, it automatically affects the cognitive complexity, the student engagement, and the technology integration. They're seamlessly integrated. Real world means students learn from, interact with, and, influence, and are influencing the real world 
through their impacting of the class, the school, the community, nation, or world. While I'm sharing, we'd love for you to use the chat room feature to add some real world projects or tasks that you use in your classrooms or maybe you've observed. That will help us learn from each other. I'll share a few as you're thinking and feel free to add more in the chat room as we as we go along. Students might use their understanding of recycling to propose different ways to implement a recycling program for their class or maybe even the school. Other projects later on as you start those those smaller projects you could expand it to a larger project with maybe impacting the community, the nation, or even a global impact to design solutions for larger challenges. With real world learning, subjects are naturally integrated. For the recycling example, students could pitch their examples to the principal or maybe even the student council, and they, could, they would be using their language arts skills as they research, as they write out their presentation and deliver the presentation, while also applying their understanding of science. Another element with real world learning is collaborating with field experts. With the recycling example, the students could speak to other schools who have a successful recycling campaign or program in their school or maybe another, another expert on sustainability. So let's use the chat room. We want to hear from Maggie and Michael and Sandy and Wyatt and Madison. We're so glad to have you guys in. Can you add some comments to our chat room? How are you using real world learning or what are some ideas that you're thinking about as you think about real world learning? Let's give a moment and share a little bit in our chat room. So as okay. people are sharing, I, 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 was, I thought, what about, and, and you may be getting to this later, so if I'm blowing it, uh, stop me. But what about, you know, people are talking about 2% time and Google time as a way for the kids to bring real world learning in. Um, does that apply to, to the framework as well? Yes, we can talk about that in a minute. Can, can we go ahead and go back to their conversation? Okay, excellent. Sure. So I, I'm seeing I'm seeing that you're putting in Cecilia. I love your idea about the unit on community gardens. Absolutely, that's a great way to connect to real world learning. I see a comment about um, participating in curriculum writing from Cecilia. Excellent, very good, very good. And Mitch brought up um, the concept of Google. Google has where they spend 20% of their time to do innovative projects. So they actually are paid, their engineers and scientists are paid to 20% of that time not to be working on main projects, but time for innovation. Um, so that's definitely real world projects with a lens on particularly that innovation. So please continue to put your ideas in the chat room. Janet's going to add some comments along as, as um, we continue on. So let's go on to our next idea, our next component. Our second component is cognitive complexity. This is, the, this is our second component of the Create Excellence Framework. And so what are some tasks that you're currently doing that really make kids think critically? Let's hear some of those in the chat room. Think about any projects or tasks, and as you think, feel free to share in the, in the chat room, and I'll continue to add a little bit more. This component, the cognitive complexity component, is based on Bloom's Taxonomy, the revised version in 2001 by Anderson and Krathal. At the lower level of this, this framework, teachers are leading instruction as students are remembering and understanding and applying information. At the higher levels of the framework, it's more student directed as students are analyzing, evaluating, and creating solutions to real world problems. These higher level tasks involve real world questions, tasks, or projects. At the top level, students are thinking like an expert and they're focused on open ended and global learning. So, what about this? Any new ideas on critical thinking in your projects?
often with these critical thinking projects, it does take a while for students to do, do them and think about it and have process time. So please allow them to have that time to think on their own. Let's go on to our third component, which is student engagement. In this component with high level, students take the responsibility for their own learning and they partner with the teacher, other students, and maybe even outside experts. Students are truly empowered in their learning as they discover answers to their own questions through investigation. In the student-directed learning, lead, learners engage in inquiry-based learning projects and collaborate within and beyond the classroom. Due to the wide variety of choice of, and options, students naturally receive differentiated learning experiences. So what about some examples here with high-level student engagement? We'd love to hear your ideas. How about Maggie or Michael or Sandy or Wyatt? What are your thoughts? How do you keep your students engaged? Yes, I, Cecilia, I agree. It would be wonderful. At the highest level of this framework, students are generating their own questions. One idea would be to pull your standard, um, think about what you want to learn, and then have students generate ideas of how they could um, get to that end. So giving them a freedom of designing that 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 process um, however if you're just beginning with real world learning that may be too overwhelming for your students or maybe even for yourself so you might want to try some more um, simulated experiences or things that are lower on the um, create fr framework which we'll, we'll show you in just a moment yes i love cecilia's idea of bringing in their own examples of something you're about to teach so that they can have a personal connection to the curriculum. Very good, wonderful ideas. All right, let's move on to our next component and last component to the CREATE framework. And that is technology integration. Think about an effective use of technology. When we think about effective use of technology, what does that look like? So let's give some opportunity, use our chat window again. What are some examples of effective use of technology? We've seen a lot of those where maybe technology is thrown in. Maybe we use an iPad here or a computer presentation tool by the teacher, but it's really not effective. Technology for simulations, right. Good ideas. Definitely for research. Technology is definitely appropriate for research. Other ideas from our members? Okay, let's keep thinking about this technology. At high levels of the framework, we want to make sure students are using technology. Often we see teachers utilizing it, but we want to make sure students have access to technology as a research tool, as Cecilia uh, brought up, as also for collaboration, designing, and a presentation tool. Technology can be used to promote collaboration among the students, teachers, field experts, or maybe even global organizations if you're engaging with them. For example, many classrooms use technology, including Edmodo, as a classroom website or kid blog for blogging, or maybe even recap or Flipgrid for video responses. As students complete project tasks, technology is seamlessly integrated at the analyze, evaluate, and create level of Bloom's taxonomy. So are there any other thoughts on technology that we want to bring up in the chat room before we move on? Okay. Next. All right, next slide. So, as we designed our book, 
for our books, we have an elementary version and a secondary version with lessons that you can all look into and experience the four core areas. And um, but we we were thinking about how to frame our work, and we found that real world thinking is truly the thrust and the umbrella for the components of the framework. So we first have real world learning where we mean overall that students are learning from and interacting with real world ideas. The ideas might very, very well come from the students themselves. So if we think back to Cecilia's post on the chat room, that's exactly where we were coming from as well. The students might be the ones that you go to for their ideas of what they want to study, so it's very authentic from them. And then everything else can flow from the real world learning umbrella. Next, we have cognitive complexity under this umbrella, where as um, Becky explained, this is where we are wanting the students to think and learn at the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy for their tasks and projects. Next, we have engagement. And this component pushes the planning to include attention for students taking responsibility for their own learning. Instruction is differentiated, and students are encouraged to partner or collaborate with the teacher, other students, or outside experts. And last, the framework, the fourth tool, or in the fourth component, is technology integration, where the students use technology as a research tool, collaboration, tech design, and presentation um, tools as well. The goal with technology use is for it to be seamlessly integrated into real world content. Next. So, as you can see, this gives us the overall combined effort of the Create Excellence framework. Next. This framework leads our teacher candidates and our current practicing teachers to meaningful and comprehensive lesson planning for innovation and excellence. Next. So at this, you receive the email from Mitch and have the handouts that we ask for you to download. You can see the handout or the, the screen that you currently have in front of you. You also have a handout of this screen, and it's our Create Excellence Framework, the actual framework that is published in our books as well. When looking at the Create Excellence Framework, if you can um, get your handout in front of you. There are some details that are helpful to know to help you navigate. Note the four columns in the CREATE acronym. The CREATE acronym, of course, matches up. You can see in the bold red letters that C goes with cognitive complexity, R with real world, and TE with the technology integration. The five rubrics go with the rows going across the page and now we'll tell you a little bit more about that. Levels one through three going down the page mention a task, while levels four and five move into more discussion about projects. Tasks are small classroom activities, while projects are more involved. Using several instructional strategies, solutions are open-ended, and more student choice and decision-making and take longer to complete. One caution that we want to kind of throw out for you to consider is that the cognitive complexity, real world learning, and engagement components are based on the student's interaction with the content or the curriculum, not the technology. So don't go into a unit building it around the technology. Don't be overly impressed with the glitz of technology and use that as your driving force. If a student creates a multimedia presentation about facts on a topic, it is at a level two in the technology integration column. Note the thick black line going across the page between the 
level three and level four. This set level three and level four and notes where the lower level is directed. Students have more choices. They partner with other students, teachers, and outside experts in designing their own tasks, processes, and solutions. In other words, they are more responsible for their own learning and beginning to think like experts. In the technology integration component, student use of technology is emphasized, not teacher use. Also, if you'll notice in the middle with the stripe of three and four for the levels, we have a buff colored shading for you to note for consistent student learning. While a level three is still teacher directed, the students are engaging in higher cognitive complex tax, tasks and projects. The students are beginning to take more responsibility for their own learning in level four. Level five could be attained after consistent learning at levels three and four and could be accomplished a few times a year. So next, to recap, as teachers plan for real world learning experiences, there is inevitably a higher level of cognitive complexity, student engagement, and technology integration. These components center around key 21st century competencies, including critical thinking, collaboration, and communication. So now that you have some background on the four components, how do you see the components of the CREATE framework fitting into what you're already teaching? We'll be taking a moment to chat in the window, and I think we've got a couple ideas going there, and feel free to respond to others so that we can engage in a true discussion. We will be having a moment for a few people to share. So if you have a mic and a webcam and you would like to speak, as Mitch said, please raise your hand and we'll be sure to bring some people up to begin speaking. So let's start thinking and sharing. How are you using these components currently in your teaching? Or what new ideas do you have for, for including these components in your classroom? One other suggestion I throw out to you is possibly what is an area that you are struggling with out of the four components. Maybe you feel like you're really strong in one area mm -hmm. and one of the areas you feel like it's a consistent struggle for you and you might be able to get some ideas for help on that as well. I know Cecilia has given us a couple responses. Um, Mitch, can we see if we could bring her up and maybe she would like to share some of her ideas for what she's doing? Hi. Hello, good evening. How are you? We've seen some great ideas in the um, chat room and so we want to explore those. Can you share some ideas maybe that can help others what you're doing now in your classroom that kind of includes some of these components? So I was looking at the um, framework that you have and um, I would say I'm probably at a level two um, only because I'm limited in the situation where I am. Uh, so I teach undergraduate students. It's a, a mathematics course like personal finance course. Um, so I, I'm struggling with the part about help, uh, how do I um, allow a student to come up with the tasks or, or with the questions that they would be interested in answering. Um, mm -hmm. You know, as I was thinking, as you all were talking, uh, so what I try to do um, is work more on perhaps the collaborative piece. Um, so what I've introduced is uh, something like collaborative quizzes where they, the questions are extensions of what we're doing in the class so that they kind of, they can't just look at their notes. They have to be able to talk to each other and try to come up with solutions. Um, multiple solutions are okay, um, things like that. But I don't know, it's kind of hard because uh, I feel like my department tells me like what are the topics that we're supposed to cover. So it's hard for me to um, allow the students, I guess, to be able to come up with their own topics. I don't know if others experience the same thing. 
Yeah, you know, I think with math particularly, and, and Janet is a math expert, so she that's kind of her key area. So you might want to converse with her later on some great ideas because she's, she's awesome in that area. But maybe you can think about some real world, uh, um, focus it around real world. I, I think a lot of times when you when you get the real world, we've found that if we can focus on how do they use that math, how, who really uses that, engineers, what kind of people use that, and then it naturally takes on an air of kind of different, different avenues to get to that. Or maybe you allow them to say, here's the math, now you tell me who uses this and how would you use it to solve a real world problem. So maybe they have to develop a way of utilizing that math to solve a real world problem. So I'm going to let Janet comment. She's probably got some other ideas. One of the, the suggestions I have for you is as, as we were trying to think about how to implement this within our classes and model it and also um, teaching undergraduates and graduate students as well, it was um, you know trying to be good stewards of our own work. And I teach an undergraduate elementary math methods course, for example. And one of the things that has worked for me is I take their assignments that um, really apply to the, the situation which, of which they're working with their school. So they have um, a practical application, so it's a very real world scenario in some of their assignments. Not all of them, but some of them. And then also, they have the opportunity for choice. And mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. opportunity for choice, which pulls in your engagement, mm -hmm. and um, then tying that to the real world scenario of being in the schools, because we have clinical hours that we do inside the schools, mm -hmm. that combination really helps the mathematics um, methods come alive for my class. But until I looked at my assignments and thought, where am I giving choice? And where am I giving them the opportunity to make the connections to something that was authentic and real world mm -hmm. for them? I was um, too I was too limiting. So that really helped me when I, I did that. It looks like we've got thank you so much, Cecilia. We're so appreciative of your comments in the in the chat room. So let's hear with somebody else. It sounds like we've got Sandy that might be willing to come up and share a little bit too. Let's hear from Sandy and her Sandy thoughts. And her thoughts. Good evening, Hi. Sandy. Hi, how are you all? Good. I'm, I'm, I'm a fifth grade AIG teacher in North Carolina. Um, and um, I, I was chatting with Mitch trying to figure out if what I was doing, am I on the right track? So I wanted to share a couple of things and get some feedback from everybody. Um, a thing I did this year, I'm, I tend to jump in when I don't always know what I'm doing. And sort of my children are always guinea pigs, I tell them. Um, one of the things that we jumped in on this year was the stock market game. Are you familiar with that? Yes, very yes. real. Very real. Yeah, so we, we jumped in there, and um, that allowed us really to integrate technology because, of course, the kids had to research stocks, and they had, uh, had to understand what was going on there, and we actually brought in a, um, a financial planner to help us to, to figure out what was going on. Um, but that was, to me, that was, um, it was pre-programmed, so that was nice for me to be able to try my hand at something that somebody else had created. And um, we stumbled through it, we st and we came in on board kind of late. But I think that we were able to um, glean something from the real world, real world experience. So um, the second thing, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm plugging in. I'm about to lose power. Excuse me, just a second. Real life. Real life. Real life. My husband's running around the house trying to find the the cord, and the dogs around. So who knows what's going to happen next? Um, so anyway, I wanted to share that if no one had ever heard of that, because this was the first year I'd ever heard of that. I think it's worth investigating, and it doesn't have to be, I mean, I could see high school kids obviously understanding that. And one of my students, the, the nice thing about the experience was, one of the kids, the kids are going home with their parents, and the child said um, to the father, can I take some of my money and actually try to invest it? So I thought, if nothing else, we had done our job in that way. Um, we're actually doing, we're going to jump into a real world project um, this next week. We're having a carnival and a 
a fundraiser with the PTO, and I'm in a part of the year that I would like to start to really make sure the kids have hands on. So we're going we're gonna to do the bake sale. So the experience will be the kids are going to actually be figuring out what it costs to make a product. And so you have to calculate all the things with all the ingredients, and then you have to figure out how to sell it. And then we're going to sell it. So they'll have the experience from sort of creating a product, rolling it in, selling it, and pushing and, and promoting their product and out the door. So am, am I anywhere close to what we need to be doing? Oh, oh you are oh, right, you're right. Um, I think um, a lot of people... A lot of times there's been a separation of what um, students are doing and I'm sorry there's a little sorry, feedback little from your speakers I think <laughs> echoing me but um, I think there's been a separation of maybe what what we've had students do in classrooms and what I'm hearing from you say that you're actually having your students help partner with like the PTO absolutely students can be get engaged in raising money for different charities they can plan that they can use their math skills to keep up with um, the uh, the the how much money they've raised they can use their ideas to pitch I know we've had um, some of our local schools have done entrepreneurial fairs where the students have to propose something to sell they sell it they track their profit and all their cost all those are great examples um, that are getting kids out there and applying those skills in in many different ways so you you're right on track I love your idea so keep turning we want to hear from your good ideas too so Go well, ahead. One, one suggestion that I, I would have for you as well is now that you have that percolating in your mind, you have mm -hmm. these two ideas, I think what's really helpful to do is to go back to the framework and look and think about where mm -hmm. you're at with the four areas because oftentimes what we find in reflecting on the work we had as classroom teachers and then working with current classroom teachers is that you might have one area, even with this really great idea, you might have one area that you hadn't thought of that can make it a comprehensively even better lesson. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I was just thinking about how with your bake sale, um, with the opportunity, you, you could potentially use the technology integration for the promoting of the bake sale. Um, with the students having choice of what um, technology they use for the promotional um, um, materials or if they put together multimedia presentations for that, but something that would be very engaging for them, but getting the technology integration in the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank so you. We're gonna, so we're gonna, you're a welcome. You're a welcome. We're going to jump on yeah, and jump look on. at some examples. So, Mitch, if you'll advance us further, we are so thankful for your comments. And now we're going to analyze a sample project to identify the four components that are in that project. Mitch, if you'll advance us one more. There we go. So, in these examples, we're going to continue to look at the framework. So, next, just a reminder of the framework of the four components. There we go. And Janet's going to share with you one of the projects. Okay, next slide, please. So let's start out by looking at this real world learning scenario with cognitive complexity, engagement, and technology integration components in it as well. And I want you to all take a moment to read through this bulleted list, kind of break it up for you a little bit. And this was a classroom teacher that um, at the beginning of the year was had her desks in rows and was doing worksheets and textbook curriculum transformed her classroom. So these are some changes that she made. And Aubrey, the one that uh, we were focusing on from her standpoint, you can read about her experience then in um, the, the experiences. So go ahead and read through here. And as you read through, identify at least one area for each component. What's one area you see where it, it's the real world learning action? What's the area of cognitive complexity? What's an area for technology integration? And what's an area for engagement? So we'll give you a couple moments.
Okay, so I invite you back and we will go ahead and take a look at each of these components. So if you want to engage in the chat room and and let us know if you have any other thoughts or things that you noticed. But as you can see here on the next slide, we have highlighted in bold white for you what we believe to be some connections to the real world. But we want to know also what you noticed. So one our overarching aspect is that this project is about the class embarking on desk redesign. Um, it is actually something that is going to be used in the school and it is something that they're interacting with for a presentation, for a student choice award with the principal and um, doing that pers persuasive presentation, so that pitch, so to speak. The next slide, please. For cognitive complexity, we need to be looking for how our students are thinking about the project. So see what you identified for cognitive complexity and see if, if you picked out any of these pieces here. What uh, Becky and I kind of talked about on this is that um, you may have noticed that Aubrey's group is generating their own questions in the design. So going back way to the beginning about Cecilia's um, idea and question about the importance of the students um, generating their own questions, that is right on with what we believe as well. Um, the students evaluate which concepts of the design will meet the needs and be most cost effective. So it's that level of, they're getting to that evaluation level and the Bloom's taxonomy. And the Bloom's thinking and work is at the create level as well as they're actually designing, testing, and evaluating the prototype. Then they're restructuring and improving the original design. Very cool. Next one, please. For engagement, maybe you noticed that Aubrey is working in a student-driven team that partners and collaborates constantly with the teacher. And when we're saying partnering, it's um, as you can connect back to the CREATE framework, that's where it's student-led and the teacher is not directing the learning, but they're partnering instead. The team works together to formulate their design and can and consults with the furniture designer from the outside, which is that aspect of engagement that we're looking for. For technology integration, the students actually build a prototype of the desk, which is a form of technology. And that's something we probably need to mention. Um, it's not always technology that's uh, electrical and on, on the computer, but there can be the building structure of technology as well that, that's a broader definition of that. Um, the students use the technology in a free program called Google SketchUp, and it's an integral tool of their design process. So for this, if you're thinking about technology integration and some of the key things that we're suggesting for you is it's not an add-on in this case, but it's integral to being able to do the project. And then for their outside contact, they consult through Skype, and they also use a, present, a persuasive presentation tool of Animoto, which is a free online tool that's amazing if you haven't seen it before. And we'll tell you more about some of these later. So that hopefully gives you a taste of how to analyze just a scenario and the different components within that. So now Becky's going to take you into some more um, projects into our book. Good. So Janet brought one of one of the examples, and Cecilia was um, bringing up some additional ideas. Uh, Mitch, if you'll move us on to the next. In, in both of these books, one of them is focused more on middle and secondary, and the other one is focused on elementary. We have several examples with each of the content example, uh, content areas, usually about four examples for each of the areas, and they are complete with the project task. We have student work, we have an example, and we have feedback on how each one of them meets each of those four components. So there are fully fleshed out projects. You are welcome to use them as is, or you might even want to modify them to meet your needs. Um, we think that, that even after looking at those, it will spur your thinking on other projects that you might develop for, for your students. So we're hopeful that those will give you some great ideas. 
Okay, let's move on to the next slide and have a look, have some discussion. We're going to look at um, the project. Um, Mitch sent you an email with both uh, the framework and a project. And the project is about some shoes. So if you will pull up that project, we're going to give you a few minutes to read it. It's the sneaky, sneaky sneaker salesman project. That's hard to say. Sorry. And if you'll give you a uh, time to see to read um, page 126, just kind of skim that to see the gist of that project. And in the chat window, we'd like you to share what kind of components do you see. So what is the technology being used in this project? What about cognitive complexity? What piece of this is higher level? What about engagement? Um, what about each of our uh, each and real world learning? So let's give you a moment to scan that. Page 128 or 126 in the book or in, in your sample, you should be able to see that. And note the component and what you see in the chat window. So let's give you a moment. So I'd like to ask a question on the on the project because I, I noticed that this project really gives the students um, a, like a, a guideline for the steps they do for the project. Is that is that generally what you recommend, or um, to what extent is it better for this for the teacher to spell out the steps? And are there times where the students can come up with the steps themselves, or is that really beyond what most students are able to do? I think it depends upon the classroom and on your students. I, mean, I think you have to understand their level. Are we broadcasting live to everybody, Mitch? Yes, yep. yes. Okay. that's why I figured I'd okay. ask this. Okay, uh, this people were reading. Okay, make sure, make sure. Okay. Um, I think it depends on your students. And, and as a teacher, you might want to start with a project that is, uh, you know, has a little choice and a little freedom and see how your students do with that. And then as, as you find success, branch out. That's kind of what I'm hearing today from maybe Sandy. She's starting some things and then expanding her use. So we might try um, certain things and then it gets wider. So for example, on this project, you might not want to do all nine steps of this. You might want to rein in or delete one of those. For example, it talks about maybe even contacting some famous runners. Well, you might feel like I want to really complete this project in a couple of days and that would extend it. So I might remove some of those. Um, or we could provide choice to students. Maybe some of your students that are ready to run and really want to tackle something more open, you could allow them to do that and others might just pursue a, a little more streamlined version of this. So that, I think that's a part of the differentiation that you look at your needs of your students um, and do that. But I think always provide choice. Sometimes I think students don't get opportunities to do this. And so we as teachers are nervous when really the students are. The students are ready to have opportunity and feel empowered and and feel excited to do this, but uh, we often as teachers feel like we have to line everything out and have to know it when when our framework proposes that we can be co-learners with our students. There might be pieces in it where the students might learn more about, they may know more about a social media campaign than we might. We might not know how to pitch our products as well as they do. And so there's an opportunity to the teacher to learn along with the students, which we would say is is great instructional practice. It's a win-win for all. One of the things too with the sample that we shared with all of you is um, there is an element of we wanted to share a project that would be something you could understand all of the thinking that could go involved, go, go into it that is involved um, with what a teacher might think through to get the product that was shared and all of the handouts that might be part of it. 
you can always take a project and you can pull back, like Becky said, you can cut back on what's given. You can give them this scenario and make it completely open-ended. But like Cecilia posted, um, I agree with that. You know, if they haven't been a part of a, a learning experience or a teaching experience like this before, a good like what Sandy was mm -hmm. doing, where you you know take some baby steps, give some you know small amounts of choice, and then um, and and these projects are not necessarily meant for you to implement exactly how they are, but to take them and think, wow, you know, with my classroom, I would want to mm -hmm. maybe do these or add this step and take this step out. It's a place for you to start. I love the idea here. Um, I'm hearing some great ideas. Maybe giving the choice in, to their presenting. Um, and you, maybe an athlete, like orthopedic, casual, mm -hmm. those are great. I think the, the more you'll know if you've got a, a higher level project because the products will be diverse. We don't want the students to come out with a, a cookie cutter project where everybody is doing the same. We haven't probably opened it up. We probably haven't allowed enough creativity and higher level thinking if they're all coming out the same. We want them to be able to have different project products and say, this is the best for this reason. So I love these adaptions, which are great that you guys are bringing up. Um, One of the things to, to go into what Sandy brought up about having um, kind of a, an area where the students are all intersecting with something. You do have a commitment to a learning outcome. So there is there is a teacher, um, I guess, a commitment that we have to make to what is the outcomes of which we want our students to learn. So there's a limit to the amount of freedom you can give for that but still um, allowing for choice and the amount of steps kind of fit in there, um, however you can make that work. But there has to be some planning and some guide on the side from you to make sure the learning outcomes still remain part of the project. I, I just addressed a little bit of Sandy's, um, or I'm sorry, Catherine noticed that there's some competition built into it. And I think healthy competition is good for students. We don't want them to be um, derogatory toward any other projects, but competition is the way of a free market enterprise. <laughs> we live in America, and a part of democracy is that businesses survive and thrive, and they're able to, um, when things change, they're able to be adaptable. And we want that. They, they need to know they need to be adaptable, that they need to be creative, that they, that I think that's a piece of learning. Not every project needs to have a competition element, um, but I don't think it's bad to include that sometimes as a healthy competition. And building in a healthy culture for um, how students review each other's work, mm -hmm. doing the peer review, which we know is so vitally important for um, our classrooms to have that. I think it all got, kind of goes back to the culture you build as a classroom teacher. That's a good point. These are great discussion items. Thank you. Mitch, let's let's head on into our last segment. So when we think about initial planning, um, where do you start? The first thing is you want to think about your standard. What is the standard? What's the content that I really want my students to learn through this project? Next to determine, think about that real world problem. If you'll start with that, it really helps to impact all the other pieces. How can it connect to the students' lives? Think about how people will utilize this content in the real world. If you're teaching algebraic equations, what jobs really need to know that skill? Also identify that real world problem. Start thinking about ways your students could use the content to address a classroom or maybe even a community problem. Perhaps there are issues on the playground or maybe even bullying in the school. These could easily be a real-world problem in the classroom to solve as students propose ways to address these issues. Third, determine the task or project. What directions do the students need? With student-directed projects, real worlds will set the context and students have choices, as we've mentioned several times, to demonstrate their learning. However, with younger students or groups that haven't engaged in project-based uh, learning, as we've discussed tonight, you might need more explicit directions to guide them. Also consider what will be the assessment at the end of the project and along the way. 
Perhaps students could have choices in demonstrating their learning, like through producing a website, a written paper, a presentation. Teachers also should think about how will they be tracking that progress, that formative assessment to checking them throughout as they go along. Some teachers in the past have used, um, had, had their students post on a Google Doc the activities that are involved in the project and then check off when they've completed those so that the teacher can understand what, what, what the groups have completed. Finally, make sure you keep an eye on whether the task or project is student or teacher directed. The focus, of course, should be on student directed learning with the teacher facilitating that progress. And we'll move to our next element, which is real world planning. When we're thinking about the real world component, consider the questions. Did you begin with the ideas from your students or from something they know or they're concerned or maybe even passionate about? Collect those inf information about your students' interests and use those to frame the project's task. Also, you might brainstorm with your class, what are ways to learn about the topic that we're studying? Use those ideas to design effective project-based instructional experiences. Does the learning provide a solution to an open-ended problem? Think about a classroom, school, or community problem that relates to the content being studied. For example, students could identify a community problem, brainstorm some solutions, and then use their persuasive writing skills to convince the community leaders that their ideas are the best ways to solve that particular problem. Does the learning investigate or simulate a real world, or does the learning really affect the real world? At minimum, the class could simulate a real, a real life. Some simulation ideas include like having maybe a class auction and selling ideas to track for students could use their fake money and then bid on those while keeping track of their expenses to allow them to practice their subtraction skills along with their budgeting money. Another elementary example is having students create unique art with geometric shapes that, are, that they are studying that is beautiful also. They could host an art gallery profiling their geometric art. Let's move to our next one, which is cognitive complexity and planning for it. We might think about with cognitive complexity the Bloom's level of the student thinking in the task. Are students being challenged to think at the analyze evaluate level? At the top levels, they will be involved in sorting information, evaluating ideas, and designing novel solutions to problems. When they're engaged in this kind of task, it's, it will take them longer to produce a final product because they will be considering more information, various perspectives, and different ideas. So remember to give your students plenty of time to think and organize project, their ideas. Next, think about if the student work from the, the project produces that level of thinking. I remember working with a teacher who was having her students create children, a children's book for a lower elementary students in the school about science concepts. While the original task was a higher level, Many students mimicked one of the books the teacher brought to class instead of creating a novel idea and a concept for their book. Teachers need to formatively assess the students' work along the way to make sure students are using critical and creative thinking. Do the students have opportunities to generate open-ended and higher-level thinking questions? Asking questions was identified as one of the only common characteristics among top successful entrepreneurs in a recent study. Students need to learn how to formulate good questions. As you begin teaching a topic, you might begin brainstorming ideas. These ideas can decide on next instructional steps. The next item is, is student engagement. When we're thinking about student engagement, we think we might support differentiation by thinking about the content, process, or product and different ways for the students to be successful. As students are also might be given choices. Notice there's a running theme of choice throughout this to increase student motiv motivation. Also consider if your students are collaborating with each other. Collaboration allows them to consider different viewpoints and practice some soft skills of teamwork. Finally, let's look at our last component, which is technology integration. When we think about technology integration, we want to make sure it's planned. 
what kind of technology tools can they be using for their experience? Maybe they're writing a review of the best ma digital math resources for kids in their grade level for a parent newsletter. And students might need to try out the apps, math games, and software. So they need technology for that. What kind of technology can be used to promote collaboration? Students might use um, Padlet, which is a digital board, which they could post what they need help with that particular day. And then the teacher would know what which group needs what, and they could focus on those particular needs. If technology is, you need to think about if technology is going to be an add-on or if it is really integrated into the process. Many teachers use Google Forms as a way of formatively assessing students' learning. And then as the process, there might be several technology tools used. And Janet is getting ready to share some information about our website that has multi a multitude of tech resources. Okay, next slide, please. So you'll see on this screen our web address for createexcellence.com. Don't forget to hyphen. And if you're like me and you always forget your own website, you can just search Create Excellence and one of our names and it'll pop up as well. But this will have the actual framework for you. And so if you ever misplace that, you can go and you can locate that again. And you will find information about how to contact us, the three of us. And um, we can also share with you professional development opportunities if you ever would like us to come and visit with you at your, at your location. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. So um, one of the favorite and most popular parts of our website is the technology tool resources. And this page right here shows you all of the categories that we currently have divided and available for technology tools that um, most, if not all of them are free, and many are available for computer and um, as apps for devices. So as you um, go to our website and explore um, this component under the resources of the website, have fun. Uh, we, we love this part and our teachers really love this when they go into this. So the next page, please, the next slide. This shows you if you went into the presentation link, what it would look like. So you can see just a clip, a screenshot here that it has Prezi, which many of you might already be familiar with, but you can um, and every time, too, when you sign up to get a free or an account with any of these Web 2.0 tools, make sure you look for an educator option and use your educator email to sign up for that because oftentimes you can get an extended version mm -hmm. or something that allows your students to use it or you get more time on presentations um, and things like that, which is fabulous to know. So, um, Next slide, please. So we'd like to just give you a minute to have a time to chat. And um, we'd like for you to consider what kind of real world problem or task you could use in your classroom. So after everything we've talked about this evening, what um, ideas have we brought up for you that you'd like to post and share that we could just real quickly um, report out on? And we'll just give you a couple minutes to post those on the chat room. Okay, we see some excitement about the website, so we're happy to, happy to be able to share that with you as well. So do any of you have some real-world problems or task ideas that maybe some of the conversations from each other or us inspired you to think about tonight? <laughs> 